All right, welcome to the Ravit Show. Here's another exciting episode today, and I'm super excited because I have Shanti Green uh, from Infocep. She's the head of AI and data strategy at Infocep. Shanti brings over 25 years of experience in helping companies harness the power of data, make evidence-based decisions, and today is here to share his incredible journey. Uh, first of all, Shanti, it's great to have you on the show. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Let's share. uh a, a lot about your experience and uh, also know a bit more about you and your background uh, so just for audience would you like to share uh and introduce yourself and also tell us a little about retail view for sure sure yeah thanks for the wonderfully warm welcome and uh hello to everybody out there so yeah i'm shanti green lead ai and data strategy and that's because i really just love data and technology I've been in this space mm-hmm. for a really long time thinking about how do we use data to help make good decisions what's the most exciting technology that we could be offering to folks and how do we bring those two things together so that's been very interesting over my career I applied a lot of data engineering and data science integrating data sources so that we could then go and build models of things like consumer behavior and I've been doing it for a while because I got my start really early I built my first neural networks back in Pascal when that was a very relevant programming language. We will pretend that we mm-hmm. don't know how old I am because of that. But yeah, <laughs> I just really enjoy the process of understanding and playing with data. And then I felt that my career in consulting made sense because it gave me the opportunity to see a really wide variety of problems where we can really have that really direct impact on what our clients are doing. When I did work as an independent, I was working for Geico Direct at some point and building geodemographic segmentation systems. So I will apologize to everyone out there if you got a mailer that said to the sensible driver at your address but not your name. Yeah, that was me. Now this was about 20 something years ago, but we were trying to segment the population by who was most likely to respond to direct mail uh, car insurance. And those types of things, understanding which consumers are likely to take which actions, I find to be, you know, very exciting and very interesting. So after my first stint in grad school, I was a PhD student in marketing and I then I was a statistician working on a loyalty marketing program. I really have been trying to figure out how can I use business intelligence, use analytics, use AI to make good decisions. It's all about that helping make those really good decisions and do that in a way that companies are going to find valuable. I think that's uh, a, a lot of things that you've done in this space uh, Shanti and I'm super excited because you kind of both an academic and a practitioner's background in data science but specifically in the marketing domain uh, can you tell me a little more about that how you draw upon that when working with clients and uh, your customers Yeah absolutely I spent about 3 years in a doctoral program in marketing and that was really motivated by how much I enjoy consumer goods and shopping and thinking about brands and customer behavior and what is it that draws people to specific brands what gets them motivated to shop for things so that's what i was most interested in studying academically but i went to grad school after spending 5 years doing database marketing analytics and building segmentation systems and building response models and my department was kind of going in a different direction they were focusing down that direction of database marketing and i was mm-hmm. like but i like consumer behavior Ah, so I eventually left grad <laughs> school and went back to actually go work for a loyalty marketing company. We had 10 million customers helping people save for college, a company called You Promise out of the Boston area. And you just had a great opportunity to do things like I built a customer lifetime value model which was super useful for us. We wanted to understand in somebody's first 30 to 90 days with us what nice. was their year like revenue potential going to be. and then we were able to use that to do things like look at all the different ways we were acquiring customers or customer acquisition channels and then rate them and then understand if we're paying people from certain channels how much should we be paying them based on what they're going to be worth to us over that next 2 year period so combining the probability that you're going to stay a customer and that you're going to keep spending with how much you'll be spending and creating that lifetime value metric so it was a really great opportunity and i was able to kind of combine what i'd been thinking about with customer behavior and which things might be relevant to their lifetime value with the fact that i'd been doing a lot of database marketing and statistics and computer science to actually write the code to build those things but i like trying to you know bring those things together right the the newest thinking about what should be happening in marketing that uh, academics bring and i still read some of those academic journals to understand what people are looking into and what they're researching 
And then what are they actually doing at Fortune 500 enterprises? Where are they going? Which things do they care about? Which ones are really going to get applied in the real world? And right. how quickly can they move with that? Because some of the tools are expensive and they're big and they're really interesting. And some of the thoughts in academia only work at certain size companies because that tends to be the data they have, right? They'll partner with a large company, but they don't tend to partner with medium businesses. And medium-sized businesses actually have very different needs. They can't buy 10 plus million dollar Salesforce instances, for example, and then take right. advantage of some of those features. But they want to do the same thing. So how do they do that? And they'll be more likely to use some of the smaller products, which have different feature sets and sometimes have more advanced ones because those companies can iterate more quickly. So it's a really interesting combination of things, getting to see different perspectives and try to bring them together, which is just a really long-winded way of me saying that, you know, I try to understand the needs of various clients, which are really businesses, and then tailor our approach, whether that's from a more academic standpoint or the innovation side, what could we do here? Or to be more practical, this is what we've seen happen because we've worked with so many different companies before. I love it. From what I've heard, first of all, great journey. Thanks for sharing uh, all the details. In uh, it completely makes sense. Uh, and now I know why you are in a space where you, you know, obviously worked with a lot of consultancies, and now you're with Infocepts. Um, I think first is what you need to do is be a people's person to understand these types of behavioral changes over the years. And obviously, uh, you've been at the forefront of it with the different companies you've worked with and your experiences and, you know, having that academic experience also implementing into the corporate world uh, is fantastic. Um, so quick question, just to follow up the conversation. As a consultant, you have probably worked with a lot of retail companies, right? Uh, so what changes have you seen in the last few years? I know with the AI coming into the game, things have massively uh, not changed, but then there has been a lot of evolution that has happened. So I would love to hear, hear a little from you. How has the retail companies uh, worked uh, in the last few years and how has it changed? You know, it re it's funny that you, it reminds me of this quote by um, a very <laughs> famous bodybuilder, Ronnie Coleman, that everybody wants to be a bodybuilder, but nobody wants to lift heavy weights. There was a couple of exactly. in the middle there. But <laughs> I will say everybody wants to use AI, but nobody wants to build mm -hmm. a solid foundation of clean data underneath that will actually allow you to build these things. So what have we seen over the last five right. years? A lot of change. One is like the technology advancement and digital transformation. Maybe five, 10 years ago, everybody was talking about digital transformation, being digital first. How do we make sure that we have those channels available for us in retail so that people can reach us? We want to be able to have good customer experiences in digital. And that's starting to evolve. Now everybody expects that, right? That's table stakes. You're going to have digital, but how do you create that omni-channel presence so that your experience is consistent across your multiple platforms? And I think there's also been a consumer behavior shift, right? We've seen more people move towards online shopping, exacerbated in the 2020 by COVID, where people weren't leaving their houses. So the question was, well, how much stuff can I get online? And I think that got people very comfortable who might not have been comfortable previously with the idea of, I can shop for this online. I could buy clothes without trying them on first because I generally know how to read the descriptions of what a size could do. So then product descriptions exactly. start to become more important. So do customer reviews, right? How do you decide if something is going to be a product that suits your needs? You start reading the reviews. Now, I generally skip the five-star reviews, but I like reading the one and two-star mm. reviews. And I'm reading those mainly to understand, is there something that stands out in this review that might actually be a problem for me? Because a lot of the one and two-stars are, like, I didn't like the company, the customer service was bad. They're really not related to the exactly. product. But True. being able to parse that and say, like, oh, they're ever, like these three all talk about bad battery life. Well, that might actually be a real problem for me. Maybe I don't want this. So I'm seeing if there a common thread among those uh, is kind of how I do some of that shopping. And I think we're, wow. we didn't see that as much five years ago. We saw people who were just trying things out and buying them. And now people kind of rely on that a little more. We can talk about how hmm. retailers like Amazon in particular are trying to use that to help build better product search. Um, hmm. And I think we saw also 
supply chain pressure, right? These economic pressures are different now, and those have changed over the last five years. That push from you know, probably 20 to 10 years ago around just-in-time inventory, nobody wanted to be holding on to inventory if they didn't have to. Well, what happened when people didn't do that? We saw that there was massive shortages. I waited four months for a car part because they couldn't, it wasn't being manufactured at the time right away, couldn't get across the ocean from where I needed it. And that's a long time to wait with your car being unavailable. <laughs> and this is just a supply chain problem. The pandemic-induced mm. problem, people not holding inventory, uh, caused these kinds of problems. We're now seeing a small shift away from you know what they were teaching in business schools at the time was around just-in-time inventory, being lean, trying to find a balance now between do I hold enough inventory for some amount of time and doing this optimization, right? So now we've got a mathematical optimization problem in supply chain that might previously have been more of a business type optimization around how do I keep the most working capital versus uh, how do I find a nice balance? So that's been a really interesting issue and it's becoming more and more salient. Uh, we're seeing cybersecurity and data privacy concerns show up more and more. Yep. It was an existential threat. Like we knew it could happen, that cybersecurity breaches could happen. <laughs> but now we see yeah. that every large company has had this happen. AT&T has leaked my data twice, like full data is out there. T-Mobile, Equifax, Experian. I can count the number of like, leaks where I get a message saying, we're sorry, we've been hacked. Your data has been exposed. And it's just a level of which data, how much. Mm. So we know that it's happening. And we're, we need to say to ourselves as consumers and as data professionals, what are the things we could be doing to prevent this from happening? Is this happening because we have unredacted, unobfuscated data in analytic databases? Is this happening mm -hmm. because our production databases aren't secure? What was previously a, like this could happen. I think now we all understand this is happening. It's going to happen. What are the steps you're going to take to mitigate that? And then from the mm. consumer privacy concerns, we've seen GDPR and CCPA, the right to be forgotten. It's actually really hard for some companies to delete data. Uh, back in right. the startup days when I was at iContact, we would really struggle with something like GDP, the right to be forgotten because figuring out all of the places a customer's data could have gotten into and based on how we had chosen to store that data made it really challenging. Like if we had to remove data from one customer from like tape backups, that would be a hugely expensive, prop, like expensive proposition. Uh, so yeah, those are things I think have changed and have really become come to the forefront more in the last five years. Right. Right. No, I, I love those points, Shanti. Uh, definitely, you know, there's a, there has been obviously technological advancements, like you say, consumer behavior shift has happened massively. Uh, cybersecurity and data privacy as a customer uh, in, you know, and obviously uh, buying it in the retail world, we need to be careful about certain things. And then obviously the economic and supply chain pressures kind of, you know, yeah. are evolving very quickly. So those are fantastic points. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I'm kind of also curious to, you know, obviously this is also the customer side and how things have kind of evolved, but I'm kind of also curious to learn more about, you know, how are companies um uh how, you know looking at something like this in this space what are the concerns for them uh do you have anything any thoughts around that yeah i've got many thoughts around that because that's really <laughs> where you know i'm hoping that companies want to talk to me right that uh and i've been hoping yeah. that for 20 years that i'm like yeah, come talk to me i've got i think i know what you exactly. want to know about uh but yeah there's some really interesting things like just Customer, customer demand evolving and changing over time, right? Retail customers have changed their preferences. It used to be you'd have people who want to shop in stores. Maybe they like the touch, the feel, the social aspect of shopping together. And you had customers who like mm -hmm. to shop online. And now you've got right. customers who want to do both. But more importantly, they expect this very consistent omni-channel experience. Whether I go to your website, you're contacting me on mobile, I think you should know who I am, what my personal preferences are, because you're collecting all this data on me, and we've all come to accept that that's part of the loyalty game. And I yep. expect that I'm going to have the same experience. So if I right. order some Chipotle, because I really like Chipotle, and I'm going to have it delivered. Well, they've got a partnership with DoorDash to deliver it. Now, something got messed up in oh. the delivery. I need them to take care of it. I want to be able to go into the Chipotle app 
figure out where's my delivery, what happened, file a request to like get a refund for the product that was missing. Yes, this happened yesterday. <laughs> and then have that all happen mm -hmm. in one place, even though I know this has to contact multiple systems. And it was interesting because as I was doing it, their, one of their help systems had to send me out to a different website to enter some more information, which meant that I had to go track down something that was in my email. And I'm like, you know what? They're really not handling this omni-channel experience very well. I want to be able to do mm. this all in one place. And if they're going to need to collect information from me that for some reason they don't already have when this chat starts, you need to put that up front. Like, hey, in order to have this conversation, you need to have your order number and your confirmation number and whatever, as opposed to me getting you know four threads into the conversation and realizing they're like, oh, do you have this thing? Like, no. Why, why would I have that right in front of me if I didn't think that was something I needed? Like, I don't just memorize confirmation numbers, except for when mm. I think they might. But yeah, there's a lot of brands, like 53% or so of brands are investing in tools that are going to allow them to sell anywhere because brands know they need to be in more places and delivering that consistent mm. experience. We're also seeing, because of that, price sensitivity being on the rise. I saw an industry statistic that 46% of shoppers have switched brands recently with price being the biggest driver for that change. And I think one wow. of the reasons yeah. is that it's much easier to compare prices. Right? If I'm shopping online in particular, it's pretty easy to check not just can I get the same product somewhere else cheaper, but also is there cheaper. a substitute product that is cheaper? If, especially if you're yeah. like a big retailer that carries multiple versions of the product, maybe 10 of them will fit my need. How am I going to decide which one is the best of those? Like some people will mm. always pick the cheapest one. Some people will pick some specific quality or color or something. But there are people who are more willing to switch brands than they might have been before. I also think that there's been a shift where some brands that started out in one place have either gone downstream and created more SKUs or gone upstream and tried to become more luxurious, which means that mm -hmm. brand as a signal of quality has gotten weaker. And I find that to be kind of interesting. I have this conversation with my father a lot because he'll like, tell me about something and be like, oh, but it's this brand. I'm like, yeah, but you bought mm -hmm. this brand at this place and they make a specific SKU for that place that is different than their normal brand quality. So it's not sending you that same signal that you remember from 30 or 40 years ago. So I think that's kind of wow. interesting, which gets into this other problem that uh, retailers are having of maintaining brand loyalty. So another interesting statistic is that 65% of companies' revenue tends to come from repeat business. And we used to mm. always have this saying that it's a lot cheaper to retain a customer than to acquire a new customer. Acquisition is very expensive. And companies right. weren't spending enough on retention. You could probably spend half as much on retention and it would be double or triple what companies were previously spending. But it would be enough to really change your revenue numbers because those are the people who want to shop with you. There's been mm. some research that says that loyal customers tend to spend more and to buy the same products at higher prices than new customers, right? You don't have to give them as many discounts. And I think we're seeing yeah. some of that changing because people know what deals are out there. And they know that, oh, if I was a new customer, I'd be getting a certain discount. And as a repeat customer, I'm not. Well, that doesn't feel good knowing that somebody's getting a better deal. And I think it was two year, one or two years ago, we actually saw T-Mobile take advantage of this and change their pricing structure to say, New customers, old customers, everybody's going to be eligible for the same deals, whether that's phone upgrades or whatever. As long as you agree to the same terms, like extending um, the payment agreements, you can have the same discounts, which I would say is somewhat revolutionary in terms of how those companies were doing their marketing. Everything else was a, we want to acquire new customers. We're always trying to like get people to sign up for our long-term service. But if why not also extend that to people who've been with you for a decade? So now every time I have a conversation with customer support, they always tell me like, thank you for being a customer for a decade. And I'm like, well, thank you for not doing anything to push me away from being a customer for a decade. Um, it's been good enough. Which gets me mm. to this other point of this thing that retailers are trying to do about improving that customer experience, right? Everybody is getting, things are getting more and more convenient to do. It's easy, I can do it on my phone, I can do it with an app, I can do it at my computer. And yes, I expect that omni-channel experience that I should be able to take any action any different way, whether that's sign up for a subscription, unsubscribe, cancel. I want to be able to do all of those things by clicking some buttons. 
if it's required that I have to have an interaction with a person, something has probably right. gone wrong in the process. Because these should be things that as a company you anticipate. So how do you improve that experience so that customers want to remain loyal? Right? These all kind of play into each other. Customers are changing their preferences. It's hard to maintain loyalty. One of the things we can do is try to improve that customer experience by understanding more about customers. Well, what is it that they want? How are they coming to us? Does our brand, does our retail establishment have a different customer profile than somewhere else? What do, these, mm. what do they look like? Uh, so that experience is really interesting. I, another wonderful stat. I like peppering statistics that I find in here. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. As, as we're finishing this sentence, 300 Amazon orders and deliveries have been fulfilled. That's just in the Amazon experience of Prime and one-click checkout. I'm a huge Prime customer. I've actually been an Amazon customer since 1998. And if they're watching this, please let me leave customer reviews again because <laughs> it's been 20-something years. Over 1,500 orders have been placed <laughs> in that time period. Wow. Yeah, it started huge. when they were just selling books, uh, which is funny because I actually remember my very first Amazon purchase. It was a very specific computer science textbook on algorithms that I really wanted and couldn't find anywhere else. And I can imagine. Over the hump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that ease, that convenience is what customers start to expect, right? They want to be able to have something delivered to them. Or maybe they want to go pick it up in store because they're going to be nearby. Or they bought it online and they want to be able to return it in store. The idea of making things as easy as possible, it's disrupting industry, right? Retail stores, especially specialty stores, were closing for a long time. Electronics retailers in the U.S., we had Circuit City. They went out of business a while. Best Buy has stayed around but it's kept trying to pivot its business a little bit and offer more services. Uh, a lot of the um, like mall type stores, the anchor stores and malls are closing mm -hmm. their retail locations and malls are now trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this space? It's hard to get new tenants in there because customers want more convenience. They don't want to have to go to a place, but when they do go to a place, they want to be able to do all of the things, right? They want, to, they want the same prices sure. that you're going to get online. They want to be able to price match. They want to be able to return easily. They want to be able to try things yeah. on. They want a specific experience in the floor space. There is a area for in-store shopping to happen, but figuring out what that experience is and what can you offer them. For places like Nordstrom, sometimes it's personal shopping. It's coffee shops and cafes in the store. It's a different yep. display. Sometimes it's a level of service that they're getting uh, from folks who work in that place that is different than they could get online. They, maybe they want recommendations. So figuring out what that is and how do we, for each brand, it's going to be different, right? For every retailer, who yep. your customers are is different enough that you need to figure out, well, what do my customers want? And then maybe how do I get more people like that? Because there's like 86% of customers say they're willing to pay more for a better customer experience. Now, we don't know how much more. <laughs> It might be 5% yeah. more, 10% more. It's probably not double, but figuring out what that level is so that you can position yourself as a retailer to say, well, what is it we offer? We offer really good service. And that will keep people mm. coming back. Uh, there was somebody I worked with in grad school, and one of the areas that he was researching was returns and how returns can actually build more loyal customers. But you can't let people just return 100% of their products, right? It's finding what's the right percentage of returns that actually builds customer loyalty. And Amazon seems to be taking advantage of this. They make it pretty easy to return things up to a certain point. And then they will tell you that, like, actually, this is a little too much. If you keep returning things, this is going to be a problem. Mm. But part of the reason, like, I have Amazon Prime is because of how easy that is. I realize something doesn't sure. work out. Click a button. Cool. Like labels generated. And now with the different locations for drop off, you don't have to print. You don't have to repackage everything. You can put it in, just show up. Somebody else will put it in a box, slap a label on it. You show me QR code and you're done. They've made that really convenient, especially for like some of the lower value items. They'll say like, don't even return it. Like it's not worth it for to go through all of that, the chain of things to get some a product back. And that just makes it really convenient for people. It really improves the customer experience helps maintain that customer loyalty, which all leads yeah. into, well, if we're, if we're doing that, we've got people coming back, we're really prepping. Now we're building that foundation for the AI future. And that's where retailers want to go. How do they take advantage of all of the data they're collecting, where people were, what kind of comparison shopping they were doing, 
what channels they came through, how they've bought from them currently, how are they buying in the past, what do we think they're going to do in the future. So there's this innovation frenzy, like let's use Gen AI, let's use predictive AI. And they're in this race mm. to see who can create the best shopping experience, the most engaging experience. They're investing in like right. customer data platforms because they want to activate that data. Right? You've got data, you're collecting data, it's sitting there somewhere, it's in transactional systems. Maybe you've got a recommendation engine, so you see what's working there and what's not. Because you want to increase like cross-sell and upsell. Uh, so, but that's in a different system, right? You've purchased a commercial recommendation engine system and kind of plugged it in. You've got an off-the-shelf AI product on the side that's building customer loyalty models. So you're feeding data there, but you're not getting the data out of there. But you've, So you're buying all of these interesting analytics platforms to activate your data. And that brings this juncture together where you've got theoretical AI strategies, what could work. You've got data-driven marketing initiatives, what has worked in the past, who is this working for, what do we think is going to happen. And we need to kind of orchestrate all of those tools. Which tools do we bring in when? How do we use them together? Right. How do we actually talk to a customer and do it at the right time? Like every now and then I will get a text message on my personal number from a company. I don't ever yeah. want to get a text message at my personal number from any retail company, even if it's to tell mm. me that something has been delivered or that my order has been processed. That's just not the medium I want to receive that information in. Right. But companies keep asking for phone numbers. Some make it a required field. And then you've got to like, they'll send you a thing. You've got to go through the process of opting out because they know that it's the only way to get people's attention, right? Attention is very divided among all the channels now. Mm. Like, well, you know, if you get a text message, you're probably going to hear the ding and look at it. So that's a good way to reach people. But it's also turning some people off as customers where they don't want exactly. to be your customer. So you need to find that balance also, which is, okay, there's lots of ways wow. to do these things. How do we find ones that aren't going to upset people? Or do we actually just need to segment our current customers? There's some people who are okay with that. I think younger customers tend to be more okay because they're very phone first. Like middle-aged mm. and older customers are more like computer first, keyboard first. Right. So they're less likely. I think... And there's uh, a lot of stores that are working on those yeah. kinds of things. Exactly. No, I think, uh, Shanti, you've kind of made a very important point here uh, uh, about, you know, obviously the age factor and then the notifications kind of, you know, obviously uh, going to them and then that that is kind of also a, a way to retain the customer. But sometimes it's like you might lose the customer too. So yeah. that is pretty interesting. Uh, sorry, I, I, you were saying something. Oh, yeah, just that there's this, you know, really transformative force kind of shaping what we're doing with AI. And it's going to help us do things like streamline operations and automate processes mm. and ultimately kind of reduce cost and potentially increase revenue. And we're seeing that from inventory optimization to do things like reducing stock outs and minimizing inventory holding, improving supply chain efficiency. And if we can bring all of it together, right, we need to break down the data silos that we're creating when we build these data platforms and pull in the new tools. We break down those silos, we bring our data together, that really is going to be the thing that helps us make good decisions because we have a full yep. unified view. What at InfoCepts we like to say, like a single pane of glass with which to view our opportunities and what's going to make sense. What are we going to do next? Which thing should we try to do? There's a lot of technologies that exist they don't all work together. So figuring out how to bring that together becomes really important. Yeah, no, I think uh, you've kind of made a very important point here. And those, you know, those details are very uh, insightful, to be honest, Shanti, because uh, those are exactly the points I was kind of wondering about as well. But that's a lot. To be honest, as an enterprise leader, I would be completely overwhelmed with so many different aspects when it comes to retail. Is there some easy way or something very straightforward how we can look into it how do i you know as a business uh, ensure that i'm investing in the right opportunities and you know when i do it obviously i want it to work uh, because and then retail industry is so huge right so i'm kind of curious about that and then i'm also wanting to learn a little about how is infoset solving it how are you solving it with your customers yeah th Thanks for the, the beautiful setup on that one. Uh, because I, you know, I love talking about what we're doing in particular. And the benefit of right. working with those customers is we see a lot of different use cases and we're able to try to pull out what's common among them 
and bring that to bear on problems. Hey, we're seeing this happen a lot of places. How can we help you? And I think it's best if right. we can kind of show rather than just yeah. describe how we view retail problems, right? What this retail view might look like. So in this situation, we're looking at a problem around, I'm a company that has to create descriptions of my products, right? I want to sell my t-shirts and my shorts and my clothing products, maybe other things through retailers like Amazon, like Walmart that have these marketplaces. But creating a description for every SKU is actually really challenging. I have to sit down mm. and write that description. And there might be different requirements for each of those platforms. It's a very manually right. intensive process. So we try to bring a view to this, if this is the problem we're looking at, uh, well, how could we solve it? So in this, we've got a business opportunity that says we could utilize a large language model to create that with custom context about our brand. Like what is our brand personality, right. our brand profile? A lot of customers companies have brand guides already. So this is copy that exists. And we can use that to then create product descriptions. So I take the manufacturer's description of this is a blue shirt made of 100% cotton that has a V neck and is a t-shirt, short sleeve. I feed that into mm. my model. I also give my model the context of things about this brand. I say, generate me a description. I can then put some parameters around that description, which are here is what Amazon needs. Here's the seven bullet points that need to be described. Please prevent those. Or for a different marketplace, I might need to say, I need a more verbose paragraph description that has better adjectives in it so that people can read mm -hmm. and feel good about this because this is going in a different kind of retailer that has that. How do I do that? Or maybe I'm using it from my own website. So people already know something about my brand, but I want them to be able to compare product to product within my website. Or I want to use my website as a testing ground to do A-B testing. I want to test my human-generated product descriptions against my AI-generated product descriptions because that's really easy to do on yep. your own retail site. Uh, a little harder to do mm -hmm. on some of the other ones. That's the problem we're looking at. We can kind of break that down by customer segment, do various channels cater to different customer segments. Because the other thing I might want to do is say like, oh, I see that the average age in my Amazon marketplace is greater than at Dick's Sporting Goods or a t-shirt that I'm selling. Well, why don't I change the copy that my LLM is generating to appeal to that different segment? They want to hear things in a different language. They have different needs. That's a really easy change to make. So I can cater to the exact audience that I'm using. I can also prioritize. Where are my sales coming from? I can see that Amazon's providing most of my sales. So I'm going to prioritize. Well, let me make sure it works there. And then I can move on to my next right. meeting as I'm trying to build my prompts and do some prompt tuning. And this is what something could look like. So we've got a product here. We pick a marketplace. We pick yep. a brand. The catalog season is basically what's my brand guide for this season, the style, the color. If I want it to be indexed by SEO, maybe I can pick specific keywords. And then mm -hmm. I go and I generate, feed that into my model. And you can use different models. You can test different models with different uh, evaluation pipelines. So you find what works for you. One of the interesting things in generative AI is that there aren't a lot of hard and fast answers. Like, this is the best for this thing. There's a lot of experimentation yep. that needs to happen. And there are some products that will help you do that evaluation. And then I can generate different types of descriptions. I can do a bullet-pointed description, product overview, code, color, seasonal collection. I can do a paragraph description. The same basic information, cool. but in different formats for the different marketplaces that I might go to. So that helps us explain for generative AI product descriptions what this would look like to the retailer. And then I want to know, well, I did this. Is it working? So we have this experience mm. screen that shows us about things about the performance of the campaign. With my LLM description tailored insights, how is that performing on the Amazon marketplace? How is that performing on the Walmart marketplace? Am I getting True. what I predicted? Yeah, like looking at my conversions. Uh, who's accepting the offer? Who receives it? And that's the way nice. we look at these problems. And we can do this for any number of problems. And we try to bring those opportunities forward where we can look at what's the business value of this opportunity so that as a business, you understand, well, this is the one I should be going after because it's going to have really high ROI. I understand the cost. Mm. I understand the timing. I understand the potential revenue gain or cost savings I'm going to get. And that's going to help me prioritize my business and direct resources where they need to go. So that's a lot of how we think about these problems. And if I'm a retailer looking at this kind of problem, the different types of insights I'd be able to pull out. 
I love it. Uh, and uh, Shanti, uh, you know, this is exactly what I feel like, you know, enterprise leaders are wanting an insight into and ha as clear as possible, not only first designing, you know, like a description for a product, but at the same time, also looking at something which is kind of, uh, you know, working on no or what's the change that they need and those types of things kind of becomes easier when it's just one platform so it looks like uh you know obviously infocepts has kind of figured it out with the creative customers that you already have and uh that is you know obviously uh happening it's keeping the businesses to make informed data-driven decisions as well good way to you know obviously uh segue into something like uh, one final advice that you would like to give to any retail customers and retail enterprise leaders out there yeah i mean i'd say the way infoceps is really helping address these issues is starting with the data integration piece that's really where it all mm. starts as you're spinning up these campaigns and using different products the data tends to actually that you've brought together to start with gets pushed out to the edge, and you need some way of bringing it back in. So all of the different products are good at ingesting data. They're not all good at pushing the data back to that central place. And that's really what we try to look for in Retail View. We start by integrating the data from the different sources where we have both a push and pull strategy. We can pull it in, bring out the insights, and then if we need to, we can push that to the different systems where people are making those decisions so that the same information is in all of those places. And that might look different for different people. For some companies, right. it might look like AI-generated product descriptions. For other companies, it might look like a recommendation engine where they know they have customers, but they've got a wide variety of customers or a wide variety of products. They need to be able to increase right. sales by recommending good products that people will really want. So adding data, bringing data together is where we start. And then really with this idea of what's the right business opportunity, by with ROI, like what's the potential for an opportunity to bring? A lot of folks miss out on that. They want to do AI for AI's sake and not because this is the particular AI initiative that has the chance to move the needle on the business. That's really going to drive savings or increase revenue. So we've mm. got insights enabled. We're able to do these kinds of things. We're able to look at building something like a complete marketer's dashboard inside of Retail View. It doesn't have to be just Product descriptions. It can be product descriptions. It can True. be subject line analysis, click through rates on marketing copy. How do we customize things for different groups? That idea of hyper personalization is really kind of the running thread here. That within this, we're able to look at customers, groups of customers, and customize the content they want in the way they want it delivered so that they're going to have the best experience possible. Because if we can deliver that omni channel marketing experience in a way that they want to receive it, then retailers are going to be able to have better business and have more customers. So I think that's a really interesting innovation. And as I said, one of the things that I try to do is help companies make good evidence-based data-driven decisions. And part of the excitement of where InfoCEPs is right now is that we're really pushing that data in this single view out to businesses so they can see what's working and then make the next decision on, oh, that works, great, let's do more of that. Or that didn't work, Let's do something different. I love it. And that's the approach, you know, obviously uh, works for a lot of enterprise leaders and what they're looking for. Uh, uh, so which is fantastic. One last question for you, Shanti. If folks want to reach out to you, which is the best place, is LinkedIn a good place to connect with you? If they have any question, any retail enterprise leaders who would like to connect with you, is LinkedIn a best place or somewhere else? Yeah, LinkedIn is a great place. I'm Shanti Green. Uh, luckily, I've got a fairly unique name combination, so I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> My email address is also shanti.green at infosep. So based on what it says in the, on the screen here, that's pretty easy for you to find. Uh, I show up pretty easily because of that. So that's been some good for personal branding, <laughs> uh, rather relatively unique combination. But yeah, I'd lo love to hear from more folks. I really enjoy talking about this. I'm pretty passionate about data in general. So I've, I will entertain many conversations because of that. <laughs> Love it. No, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, again visiting the Ravid Show, Shanti, and sharing all the amazing data driven uh, decision making that happens in the retail world. Uh, a, you know, how things have kind of moved and those statistics. I love how you are a number person. You have like statistics just so close to you. 
um because it kind of gives you a good view into what exactly is happening and uh, now i know why you are in the retail world because everyone love numbers there as well so that's awesome uh, shanti once again uh, thanks for visiting the ravi show and thanks for sharing all the great insights yeah it's been a lot of fun thanks very much for having me on thank you thank you everyone for joining us today